Good morning, everyone. My name is Carmen. I'm a CIRAS researcher um, based in South Portugal. And I will <clears throat> talk on challenge number one, which is achieving social recognition of CIRAS importance. Before starting, I would like to thank uh, Project CIRAS for the invitation to be part of this panel today. The lack of recognition of CIRAS was first acknowledged uh, in the research community by Carlos Duarte and colleagues 15 years ago. And in their article, they compared the number of scientific publications and media reports on four types of uh, coastal ecosystems, sea grasses, salt marshes, mangroves, and coral reefs. <clears throat> the results showed that um, coral uh, reefs uh, receive a disproportionate attention when compared to the other ecosystems, but especially when compared to sea grasses. One of the justifications for this result was that seagrasses were not seen <coughs> as charismatic as coral reefs. Since the publication of that paper, there has been an improvement in the, in the publication effort and in the media attention uh, that seagrasses receive, uh, but other recent uh, similar studies uh, demonstrated that uh, seagrasses <coughs> are still far behind coral reefs and mangroves. From this and other works, as well as the shared experience of the uh, global seagrass research community, it is clear that social recognition of uh, seagrasses is still limited. And this is a problem because seagrasses are important coastal ecosystems for the many services they provide, and because they have been lost histori historically along all coasts over the world and remain still threatened in many places. We refer to social recognition of seagrasses when the society gives value and understands how seagrass ecosystems contribute to human well-being and to the health of the planet. And only when the society is aware of the importance of seagrasses, they will take uh, care about them. The most important aspect of social recognition is that it, it can result in a change of people's behavior in response to environmental concerns. Um, and this is needed to, to achieve a sustainable use of coastal, of coastal ecosystem in the future. Why? Well, because when there is a high level of recognition, people will take well-informed decisions that will lead to reverse seagrass losses and enhance the benefits they provide. On the opposite scenario, um, when there is a low level of social recognition, people will make ill-informed decisions that will lead to seagrass degradation and loss. Thus, a major challenge is to develop strategies to improve global societal recognition of seagrasses through their understanding and creating attitudes and behaviors towards the importance of, of uh, protecting them. In their article, uh, Global Challenges for Seagrass Conservation, uh, Richard Hansworth and colleagues identified three actions to improve social recognition of seagrasses. The first is to increase uh, experiential learning opportunities. And this is essential because um, learning is the primary process uh, by which we navigate through life, and it is how we make decisions and we solve problems. But why experiential learning? Well, <clears throat> this is a way of learning in which people experience something for uh, themselves and then reflect and think about what they have learned. And this way of learning leads people to act and make informed decisions. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to invest in people making better decisions. However, human population growth, uh, the, uh, the urbanization and the socioeconomic uh, disparity um, threaten people's opportunity to engage and connect directly with nature, including seagrasses. So educators, researchers and other stakeholders uh, interested or involved in raising awareness of seagrass ecosystem should opt for activities that promote human nature interactions because these are very poor nowadays in most of the societies. The second recommendation of the authors of the article is to bring together research and expertise from other fields of study because seeking social recognition uh, through the natural sciences alone may not be effective. They propose integrating social sciences such as uh, psychology, sociology and communication sciences to overcome some of the barriers in the lack of awareness of seagrasses. Personally, I believe that other disciplines that uh, could be used to improve the social recognition of seagrasses are the arts uh, because uh, they have the power to connect deeply with emotions 
And I strongly believe that in order to raise awareness of seagrasses, we need to create emotional bonds between people and nature. The last recommendation is to develop partnerships with uh, the global media. And this includes the three main categories, which are news media, web media, and of course, social media. And these uh, are complementary tools uh, that create opportunities and provides a diverse range of channels of communication with different audiences to communicate about seagrasses, their benefits, and their conservation issues. Now, I would like to highlight two recent milestones that have or will have a positive impact in our goal of increasing social recognition. The first one is the publication of the Global Synthesis Report out of the Blue, which was released in 2020 by the United Nations Environment uh, Program, uh, together with GRID, Arendal, and UNEP's uh, World <coughs> Conservation Monitoring Center. And this document is a milestone because it's the first of its kind to provide a call to action to managers and decision makers to protect seagrasses. <clears throat> the second is what we are celebrating today in this event, and is the declaration of the World Seagrass Day, which, which was adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly last year, based on a resolution that was sponsored by the government of Sri Lanka. <clears throat> Personally, I think that uh, these two achievements, as well as many others in the history of social or scientific uh, recognition of seagrasses, are due to the fact that uh, behind them are enthusiastic and dedicated people and teams that work for what they believe in. Before finishing, I would like to share what uh, we are doing uh, in South Portugal to raise awareness on serious meters at the local and national levels. We combine different approaches. In the formal education category, we train a, a K-12 teachers on serious biology, ecology and ecosystem services, so they can apply this knowledge in their classroom. We also organize outreach activities, uh, such as exhibitions in the science museums and kayak tours uh, to raise awareness by informal education. We have a continuous dialogue with the governmental institutions that are responsible of uh, nature conservation and the environment in Portugal. And this is to make sure that seagrasses are recognized in the national policies and in management actions. We create press releases, media content, and we give interviews to disseminate our research and um, educational activities in the media. And finally, well, we have uh, recently been in contact with uh, visual artists in the framework of uh, partnerships created by Project Seagrass and a private company to raise awareness on seagrasses. I would like you to take three messages from this presentation. The first one is that we still need to invest in social recognition of seagrasses because despite the advances done in the, de in the last decade, it is still limited. Um, and we can do this by creating learning opportunities, uh, by adopting interdisciplinary approaches and collaborating with global media. And we also need dedicated and enthusiastic people that work on what so they believe in, and this is to reach new milestones as we have done in the last years. Thank you very much for your attention. One of the biggest challenges of seagrass conservation around the world is knowing where it is and what condition it's in. So actually appropriate action can be take to, taken to conserve it. The image here in the background is of uh, myself and my, my team out uh, in a bitterly, bitterly cold April snorkel in, in North Wales. I think it'd been sleeting that day. We were freezing. But the reason we were in the water was to actually um, try and get some basic information on the presence of a seagrass meadow that had once been recorded in Aversock over 100 years ago. And we had some information that it might still be there. So we went out. And it sort of highlights the, the challenges, really, of, uh, of getting data about where seagrass is, um, whether it's actually there or not, um, and what condition it's actually in. Because sometimes that, that includes lots of fancy um, remote satellites, but sometimes it's about getting wet, cold, 
um, and and just getting in there and finding out something about that um, seagrass. This slide exemplifies the need to map and to monitor seagrass. These four points on seagrass spotter are one of the few bits of data that remain from a five hectare seagrass meadow that was mapped for the first time, fortunately, in 2014 uh, by myself and uh, a couple of students, and which actually disappeared not long after that and has, and has never recovered. Unfortunately, it had never been monitored. And there was no long term data to understand what the cause of this loss was. But in, uh, in many parts of the world, we're not fortunate to have these records of loss and therefore not be able to uh, um, make a case for trying to, to bring back seagrass or to try and improve conditions that um, improve the likelihood of recovery or perhaps restoration. It's not just mapping of seagrass that's important. It is also the, the long term monitoring to be able to, to make interventions early on to understand what are driving populations and trying to ultimately take measures that ensure the, the long term resilience of a, uh, um, a particular uh, habitat. Here is a, a figure of uh, density of seagrass from up in Lindisfarne on the, the northeast coast of, uh, of England. And here you can see that over a, um, over a 10 year period, the seagrass um, has gone up, it's gone down, it's gone back up again, it's crashed completely, and then it's recovered again. And from a, um, a management perspective, um, the first concern in 2017 would be there's very little seagrass. And uh, but and is there some sort of anthropogenic factor influencing that seagrass? And actually, the, there could well be some uh, interactions. But what we found from actually looking at this data and trying to understand it relative to, to local climate variability was actually some of the the winter time temperatures and um, freshwater pulses are actually some of the uh, the biggest. Uh, impacts on that and you think well, why why the winter time but this is an intertidal population of seagrass where um, the population is, is commonly annual so seed setting and uh, germination is pretty pretty important so therefore those triggers in the winter time to actually uh, influence germination uh, are probably quite uh, critical and therefore some of these dips and troughs uh, are probably not of huge concern we just need to ensure that um, seed production maintains, is maintained as being high and um, that um, we're mindful of the, the, the wintertime conditions. But ultimately, it's only by being able to, to look at the long-term trends can we begin to understand what is driving those populations and uh, make interventions that are appropriate to that uh, local population. But what can we do? to help map and to monitor the world seagrass. Governments are not going to take the necessary action to do this. We know that it's too big a cost and uh, the political will is not there. Communities have to do it themselves. Whether that community uh, is based on um, uh, individuals work, walking along a beach, finding some seagrass, going for a little snorkel, taking a picture. Whether it's actually a community in a, in a, in a village realizing that they've got some seagrass on the doorstep and they want to understand more about it and they want to map it. There are plenty of community um, citizen science uh, tools out there that can help contribute to understanding the world's seagrass. Beyond that, there's other communities that are really interested in seagrass. And I find this great, great picture up here on the top right, uh, which is from a fishing website telling people how to how to find seagrass on Google Earth. We need to bring that information together into the uh, into our sort of collective understanding. But importantly, there are companies, enterprises out there who are trying to, to do their bit for the environment and um, also make a contribution to this as sphere. We've got major uh, remote sensing projects happening uh, around the world. 
um, in the UK, got an organization doing it. Um, um, globally, there's some groups working on it. And uh, we've also partnering at Project Seagrass with a, with a group building uh, an armada of uh, remote vessels that we, we're using to uh, acoustically map the seabed. So there are a lot of good tools out there, but the reality is that none of them are, are perfect. Um, they all have their challenges. Um, it's a bit easier sometimes looking at a, a clear water in the Mediterranean and uh, mapping with a satellite there relative to a turbid algae filled bay in, uh, um, in North Wales. So the challenges uh, exist at every level and we need to, to, to pool resources. Um, we need to be able to, to use the citizen science approach at the same time as being able to use the technological uh, approach. And ultimately that brings me to my, my final slide, which is that there is no solution to um, mapping seagrass. It's about bringing all the different collective responses and abilities and skills and tools together to actually map the world seagrass. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. I've been asked to give my perspectives about Challenge Tree, which is identifying threatening activities at local scales to target management actions accordingly. But first, I'd like to start by acknowledging the local coastal communities of Johor as the primary stakeholders and custodians of the seagrass ecosystems we work in. Their local expert knowledge has enriched and paved the way for my work and that of my fellow researchers and I hope that we may continue to learn from them. Seagrass meadows face quite a variety of threats. And if we look to expert opinion about what those top threats might be, as Elena Grech and co-authors did in their paper in 2012, here are the four top threats to seagrass across the world. Agriculture runoff, urban or industrial runoff, urban or port infrastructure development, and dredging. And uh, zooming in to Southeast Asia, um, Sudo and co-authors in 2021 found that meadows here are declining at an annual average rate of around 5%. They used the literature survey approach and identified very similar threats to seagrass, which were coastal development, aquaculture, destructive fishing, and water quality. But they used very different terms for those threats. For instance, coastal development would have been categorized as urban or port infrastructure development in Elena's paper, and also water quality in Sudo's paper matches with the category of agricultural runoff up here. Um, I think the issue of differing terminologies for threats might be an interesting point to pick up later in this discussion. If we look at the breakdown for each country shown in these columns here, there's the Ryukyu Island of Japan, Southern mainland China, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam with the total at the end here, we'll see that the body of knowledge about threats to seagrass decline in Southeast Asia is rather patchy. Most of the papers came from Thailand and Vietnam. And there was just one paper coming out of the Philippines, which is surprising because the Philippines is a significant seagrass bi biodiversity hotspot. There was none from Indonesia, which has the longest coastline in Southeast Asia. To conclude, Southeast Asia loses 5% of its seagrass meadows every year but the body of published scientific knowledge about the causes of seagrass decline is patchy, and we have critical gaps for areas in Southeast Asia that are seagrass hotspots. The question is, what can we do to build up this body of knowledge about threats? The seagrass community agrees on the value of local ecological knowledge in identifying local threats. LEK are understandings, beliefs, and practices that human societies have developed in relation to their local ecosystems. And because LEK comes from long-term direct observations of an ecosystem by people who live in an area, it can be incredibly valuable for identifying threats to seagrass ecosystems that might otherwise go unnoticed. For instance, seasonal threats may not be immediately apparent to a visiting scientist. But there are challenges associated with using LEK, and I'd like to point out three of these in the rest of this presentation. There are a few nice examples of LEK being used to identify threatening activities to seagrass from around the world, 
But here's an example of how LEK helped us in our work at the Johor River Estuary in Malaysia. The intertidal seagrass meadow here used to be extensive and of very high coverage. But in 2022, when we tried to relocate these meadows to do seagrass monitoring, we found that they were either gone or were dominated more by pioneer species with low diversity, and they were very different from their original condition. So we asked those in the communities who had direct experience of the seagrass decline about what they thought the causes of seagrass decline might have been. Most of them said dirty water, which came from either industrial runoff or from port infrastructure development. In one village, hot water effluent from a palm oil mill was said to be the cause of meadow decline. And once that mill shut down a few years ago, the meadow slowly recovered. And this explains why it's dominated more by holophila now. Also, sea filling or land reclamation in the vicinity of one meadow was said to have narrowed the river mouth and caused hydrodynamic changes that impacted the meadow. So overall, we found the community members to be very tuned into environmental changes and their insights helped us put together a funding plan to monitor those specific anthropogenic activities. So in this instance, in an intertidal meadow with visibly obvious threats such as port construction and sea filling, LEK provided a great foundation for our science work, but this isn't always the case. Using LEK for subtidal meadows in waters that are optically complex has been much more challenging because these are not so easy for local communities to keep track of. And this video here is to show what it looks like in terms of visibility in some of the subtidal meadows that we study. This particular meadow went through a dieback period in 2016 to 2017, but that dieback wasn't fully evident to the local communities. However, when we told them the meadow had declined, they could very quickly pinpoint certain environmental changes. Some suggested stronger storms that had caused erosion, some pointed out that there had been more dugongs grazing in the area. So there are still ways to utilize LEK for meadows that are less accessible, but it's not as straightforward as for intertidal meadows, and we have to keep that in mind. But here's the bad news. We are encouraging seagrass researchers to leverage on LEK to identify threats but LEK itself is dynamic and is, unfortunately, on a downward trend, as shown by Shankar Aswani and co-authors in this paper in 2018. This diagram shows the temporal distribution of all papers about LEK trends, which were either shown to be losses or persistence or as being ambiguous. And the blue bars here show that there were more LEK losses between 1992 in 2015. LEK losses or erosion can happen because of globalization and modernization. And in some cases um, here, it can happen because of top-down approaches to conservation. But I won't go into that right now. We can always pick it up in a discussion session. The main message here is that if LEK is eroded, will that desensitize the community to environmental loss, including seagrass loss? In the course of interacting with local communities to identify threats to seagrass, there were some unexpected issues that emerged about the relationships between researchers and the communities they work with. Community members gave accounts of how researchers would enter a community to collect information or samples from them, but without giving due credit to the community. And that was something they took to heart. They perceived researchers as seeing them, the community, as resources and that there are LEKs there for us to harvest or extract, but they would much rather be seen as equal partners. My takeaway from this is that we should acknowledge the value of working in multidisciplinary teams, which should include social scientists who are tuned in to the ethics and best practices of working with human societies. To summarize, LEK may be more useful for visible impacts and threats and that might mean subtidal seagrass in waters that are optically complex may not enjoy the same benefits from LEK as do intertidal meadows. The global base of LEK is eroding, 
And we should be concerned because this means we may lose a source of information when trying to identify threats that only local communities can do. So what should we be doing about this? And finally, if we want to use LAK to identify threatening activities to seagrass, we can't just regard the community as a resource. We also need to engage with them in a respectful and mindful way by giving them due credit in our work and acknowledging them as partners and local experts. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to comment on the challenge number four in global seagrass conservation. And th that is using the social ecological system to balance the needs of the people and the planet. And what I'm going to do today is to comment on three key points that I need, that we need to work further when we are talking about the social ecological system and the whole challenge. Uh, the social ecological system has brought huge advances, but I think that we, there is a scope and space to more of this. So regarding this challenge, I want to bring to your attention three key points. Point number one, strong managers. Point number two, inclusive management. And point number three, what needs? When we talk about the balance between people and planet, we should ask more deeply what kind of needs are we talking about. And uh, point number one and point number two are very straightforward and can be actually implemented right away. Point number three is a more long-term challenge. So point number one of a strong managers, a uh, social ecological systems concept is a relatively new concept. It has no more than 30 years uh, on the scientific community. And we know that uh, it takes quite a long time for science to seeper down and gain other domains. And uh, specifically when we talk about real managers and real management done at the ground. Uh, we know also that this uh, type of management is more complex than conventional management, uh, for example, top-down approaches. So we need really to invest in capacity building for managers. Uh, and what I mean with managers here is those managers working with the system on a daily basis, those managers that are normally hired at governmental agencies. It can be others, but those in the governmental agencies have the normally the budget and the authority to be able to do policy legislation, to take samples and to monitor. Now, the second point of inclusion and inclusive management refers to focusing and integrating all the people that actually is working with the system, interacting with the system, taking benefits from the system. Uh, we tend to focus on fishermen, but actually we have women, we have children, we have elders that are interacting and being with seagrasses in an everyday basis also. Uh, if we do this, we will increase participation, we will increase justice and equity, and we will contribute to the sustainable development goals. Uh, and I think that a very important point here is that to include the uh, people and the actors that are relevant to the system, it will provide a better and more realistic representation of the whole system. And this in turn will make possible to do better science, better management and better governance. Now we are in point number three of what needs. This is the more complex one. And this is the one that needs more, um, a longer time frame to be developed. So 
This is because the use of this uh, social ecological system approach has philosophical implications. We have to ask ourselves, what are our philosophical basis to use this? Do we have an instrumental view in which we only expect the seagrasses to provide woods and services to humans? Or do we have a deep ecological view in which seagrasses have own value, own right to exist, and a deep intrinsical value? Uh, these two extremes are important, and we have to ask, where are we in this? Uh, when it comes to philosophy of science, it has also very uh, uh, deep implications in terms of ontological and epistemological issues. Uh, the social ecological system used to be portrayed as two circles. In one, we have nature, and in the other, we have society. But actually, the idea of the concept is that we have only one integrated system, and we have to develop further how do we deal with this single system that is not two circles anymore. Then the, the next point is that in, in a way it's a relatively easy to see what are the needs of seagrasses. They need clean water, they need nutrients, they need light, they need a stable sediments, they need to be left alone, etc. But when it comes to the needs of the humans, this is, this is not very easy to determine. Uh, and I think that sometimes we tend to oversimplify it and say that the needs of the humans is high quality protein. But uh, I think that we have to make more research to embrace the whole set of human needs. So to recapitulate, Point number one of a strong managers. We need managers that have good knowledge of what is the social ecological system, and we need to target managers that are in real and daily contact with the system. Point number two, we need to take seriously the issue of inclusive management to get a better representation of the system. This is good for science, this is good for management, and this is good for governance. And point number three, we should be aware of the philosophical and scientific implications of working with this type of uh, framework. And we need to think more about this, and we need to develop it even more. And finally, thank you so much. This is a great achievement. And I think that we should have a party after this wonderful seminar. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Gary Kendrick, and I'm here today to talk about Challenge 5, generating scientific research to support conservation actions. Seagrass has evolved some, um, over the last 100 million years. And 100 million years ago, the world was a very different place. There was a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere and in, in the seawater, and the temperatures were much warmer. So the average sea temperatures were around 22 degrees Celsius. On top of that, they've evolved in a time of changing uh, steric height of the sea or sea level. Um, sometimes quite dramatically, plus or minus 150 meters. But that doesn't mean they're not under threat through anthropogenic activity. And this talk is about research for conservation of seagrasses. And I've chosen four major areas to focus on. I don't have a lot of time. One is maintaining resilience in coastal systems, um, looking at timescales of loss and recovery, synergistic and additive impacts and assisted recovery through restoration. Also understanding the connectivity across habitats and ecosystems. Uh, this is, includes things like looking at the atmospheric land, river, coast, mangrove, seagrass, coral reef, open ocean, global ecosystem. But look at everything in a holistic way. Trophy connectivity, the behavioral seascape. 
The third one is understanding the historical and deep ecology of contemporary seagrasses. And this is because seagrasses have evolved to live in salty, high light, wetted sediment, estuarine in estuarine and coastal environments. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the microbial landscape. I'll fi finish with talking about societal perceptions and uh, talk a little bit about e indigenous ecological knowledge and community enrollment and participation. Number one, maintaining resilience. I'd like to use a personal story here, one that um, affected the whole of the West Australian coastline in 2011. There was an extreme marine heat wave and in Shark Bay we lost a thousand of the 4,300 square kilometres of seagrasses uh, post the, the extreme heat wave. The response was whole of community. A scientific response was to really collate and look at what the impact was and how much recovery occurred post the heat wave. And these are just some documents. So one I'd like to point to, of course, is the application of the Climate Vulnerability Index to Shark Bay. This is looking into the future. It looks like Shark Bay is warming, both in the air and the water, and it's going to become an extreme environment for all organisms, including humans, to live in. But well, what's really come out of this is we've just released the Wamsi Shark Bay Science Plan, um, which will put uh, inject about $20 million into climate-related research in the seagrass-dominated ecosystem. Number two, understanding ecosystem connectivity. Here I, I fall back on a paper that I was involved in with Kate O'Brien led um, and really put together a great story about looking at everything at cross scales, looking at from the seconds and minutes to hours, days, weeks, months, years, and, and into centuries, and looking at the scales of millimetres to tens of thousands of kilometres in relation to how you manage for, for conservation persistence of seagrasses. Um, we applied some of these ideas to the trophic ch the changes in trophic structure in Shark Bay after the loss of a thousand square kilometres of seagrass. Um, that loss resulted in that the bottom up effect, resulted in changes in the scallop and cra uh, crab fishery, which declined dramatically in the system. Um, sea snakes and cormorants and green turtles and dugongs and dolphins declined in the system and stayed low in numbers. Um, over the, uh, the recorded studies. Number three, understanding historical deep ecology of seagrasses. With the explosion of genomic methodologies these days, we've been able to really hone in on underst our understanding of the, the source and the of present distributions of species and to look at connectivity in a very serious way and to understand the importance of connectivity in conservation. We've also been able to look at the deep evolution of the genomes of seagrasses through whole genome methodologies just recently. And what they're pointing towards is, is that seagrasses are a polyphyletic group where individual families have followed different routes for evolution into the salty environment they live in. I mentioned the seagrass hollow biont, and, and this has been a personal journey for me in my understanding of the importance of sulfur in uh, marine um, coastal ecosystems, and especially in sediments, and the effect of sulfur on, on the health of seagrasses. Um, I've been very lucky to work with uh, Schultz and Martin and Fraser um, over the years. Schultz um, and Martin describe these wonderful uh, things called cable bacteria, which are basically just proton pumps um, or batteries that keep um, oxygenation occurring where the, the young uh, roots are growing. Um, but it's really at the rhizoplane. It's not the whole sediment, the bulk sediment. Whereas uh, Fraser has taken a much bigger view. He's looked at bulk sediment as well as the rhizosphere and found strong microbial sulfur, sulfur genes associated with sulfide intrusion into seagrasses. So there seems to be some sort of syn uh, synergy going on between the sulfur um, oxidization and the increase in sulfur effects on seagrasses. Martin has also done some really nice work looking at the functional uh, uh, core functions associated with microbiomes. Um, and again, sulfur cyclers turn out to be very, very important 
uh, your gamma proteobacteria, delta proteobacteria, um, etc. And um, I think this this sort of uh, groundbreaking work leads us to a greater understanding of the seagrass as a community uh, with all of its microbes associated with it. We need to influence society and get society involved, get communities involved with the conservation of seagrasses. And uh, one of the greatest sources of information about deep ecology and the relationship of a coast and sea country and land country and the changes that have occurred over the last 45,000 years in Australia have been indigenous uh, Australian Aborigines. And I'd just like to give you two sort of quick examples here. One, the Bardi Jawi in the, in the um, Dampier Archipelago in northern Kimberley have looked at their traditional ecological knowledge and wondered how they could maintain the existing knowledge using um, a monitoring program based on scientific ecological knowledge. And this combination of science and, in, and indigenous knowledge really works well for an ecologist. I highly recommend getting involved with indigenous communities. And on that note, the Mulgana from Shark Bay are heavily involved with me in the actively involved in with me in the seagrass restoration at the scales of hectares in the present time. We are all involved in seagrass restoration at some level. Um, or conservation seagrasses. But I'd just like to point out two projects I've been involved in. One, uh, the Operation Posidonia from New South Wales in Australia, uh, which is really trying to look after meadows that are highly threatened um, through restoration. And then the, a more recent program I've been involved in is Seeds for Snapper. And Seeds for Snapper is about planting Posidonia seeds to make habitat for juvenile snapper. Um, and the other way we communicate is through stories. Um, I think we've got to move away from that passive form of communication and get much, much more active to be really effective in conserving seagrasses. My area um, I'm supposed to be talking about, theme five, is science for conservation. And the Seeds for Snapper program is a classic one where we've been able to take 12 years of learning in how to do seed-based restoration and turn it into a program that has over 750 active participants um, um, in 2022 in West Australia. Rather than finishing with a list, I always like going back to looking at, at the world um, as a social ecological system. I really can't remember where I got this, this figure from, but I love this figure. It's about the society adapt, uh, our, our adaptive capacity for maintaining resilience with ourselves and the natural environment around us. And it's the will and intent we put towards that and the ability to accept change and modify our behaviours and in our proaction and bold decision making in that area. And today I've just talked about the knowledge to inform the decision making. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jesse Jarvis, and I am excited to talk to you on World Seagrass Day about seagrass conservation and action in an era of climate change. First, the seagrass ecosystems occur at local, regional, and global levels. Examples of local threats to seagrasses include direct competition with aquaculture for bottom area, or even impacts of fishing gear on seagrass meadow area, including things like prop scars. Regional impacts include agricultural runoff and urban runoff from urban infrastructure, which can negatively impact water clarity and therefore affect seagrass growth and survival. At a global scale, one of the bigger impacts are those from climate change. And those include temperature increases, which can result in habitat loss through heat stress, altered rainfall patterns, which can either increase or decrease salinity, causing again more osmotic stress for seagrasses. And then even sea level rise. So as sea levels rise, it can result in loss of habitat if the shoreline has been hardened and the seagrasses can't expand inward. Those so the deep edge of the meadow can actually be negatively affected by not having enough light. Impacts of climate change on seagrass habitats are already being observed globally. Here's an example of the after effects of a marine heat wave in Shark Bay in Australia. Prior to the heat wave, there were very lush Posidonia meadows, including those seen in figures A and B on the top. And then following the marine heat wave event, there was also a, a significant loss 
of a seagrass area and cover throughout the system. And we're seeing examples of negative impacts of climate change um, in areas all over the globe, including the Mediterranean and throughout parts of the United States. The good news is, despite the overall predicted uh, continued impacts of climate change to occur in seagrass meadows in the next 50 to 100 years, and those which will ultimately reduce the resilience, ecosystem services, and global coverage of seagrasses, because seagrasses respond relatively well to conservation efforts, and we have made some strides when it comes to restoration of seagrass habitats, even under very stressful conditions, the benefit of conservation remains the same even into the future and may actually have a better, bigger overall impact in protecting and conserving seagrasses than other important coastal ecosystems, including coral reefs. When it comes to seagrass conservation under a changing climate, there are four main areas that we need to consider. The first is where are seagrasses now and where do we expect them to be distributed in the future? This is a global map of seagrass distribution broken up into different bioregions based on temperatures and species. We divide these regions into places like temperate areas, tropical, and Mediterranean areas. And this is where we have the green dots are known areas of seagrass observations. And we know that this is where they are located now. However, under a changing climate, species distributions have already begun to shift as both temperate and tropical species begin to move poleward. As such, these different observations where their seagrasses are located currently may not be where they are in the future. And conservation efforts need to consider what happens when seagrasses move. How do they interact with species that are currently in areas where they expand to? How does that affect ecosystem function? And then how does that affect our overall conservation efforts and our success in conservation? In addition to a better understanding of seagrass distribution under a climate, warming climate, it's also important for us to get additional early warning indicators for when conservation efforts are needed or if they're working. So currently, a lot of our seagrass monitoring efforts rely very heavily on structural and demographic indicators, including seagrass area, density, percent cover. However, it can take several months of environmental stress before we see any change in these structural indicators. Therefore, this we, when we do start to first see an indication that there's something is stressing the seagrass meadows, it, it typically happens right before or during or even after a large degradation event, so a large loss of seagrass. And that is the same for both small and large types of seagrass species. However, if we could also add to our monitoring programs some additional physiological and biochemical indicators, which respond to stress in order of magnitude of weeks rather than months, we could pick up those degradation events a little earlier, and that would allow us a greater chance to enforce some conservation efforts and help with increased resilience of seagrass meadows prior to the environmental stress resulting in large-scale declines. We may also need to rethink our conservation targets themselves. A lot of regions globally have its seagrass conservation targets based on previous distribution of seagrasses throughout the system and also their water quality conditions that allow them to grow and survive. Many of these light requirements, however, are expected to change as climate continues to warm. As you have an increase in overall water temperatures, that is going to increase the amount of light that plants need to survive and will therefore decrease the amount of depth where they can actually survive and reduce the amount of area where seagrasses may actually be able to survive in these regions. And therefore, we need to rethink not only our conservation targets based on what conditions were like when they were originally established, but what they will actually potentially be like in the future. In addition, when we're establishing our conservation targets, we need to consider the cumulative impacts of stress that occur across molecular, physiological, and morphological levels, and how that may actually impact the responsibility, their ability of seagrasses to respond to additional stressors. And we need to consider how climate change will affect the feedback loops that already exist within seagrass meadows. For example, if there's a decline in seagrass area due to a marine heat wave, how will that affect a previous positive feedback loop where there's a lot of seagrass cover would reduce in the amount of sediment in the water column and increase water clarity. If that feedback loop is lost, how does that affect the ability of seagrasses in those areas to respond to climate change? So both cumulative impacts and feedback loops need to be considered when it comes to establishing conservation targets. In addition, innovative restoration techniques are needed. For example, moving beyond collecting seeds and using them in that same area to potentially establishing seagrass nurseries 
where we can maintain and grow poppy goals that are potentially more resilient to stress in, in different areas. And we're seeing some of these nurseries already beginning to develop in places like Florida and the United States, um, in Australia, and in the UK. Following the footsteps of terrestrial conservation efforts, in particular those of forestry management, there's been discussion lately of potentially using assisted migration to help with seagrass conservation, in particular the idea of seed migration, where seed sources are moved climatically or geographically within their current ranges to help increase the resilience and help maintain genetic diversity of the species throughout its range from areas that are currently being impacted by climate change to those that will be impacted to a greater extent in the future. So in summary, seagrass conservation action in an era of climate change should consider how to incorporate projected future distributions of seagrasses into habitat conservation efforts, should use indicators that provide an early warning of seagrass climate change impacts, could also use future climate adjusted conservation targets that allow for both consideration of cumulative impacts and ecological feedbacks and how climate change affects those feedbacks. And finally, continue to develop and innovate restoration techniques to build resiliency into our seagrass habitat. With that, I'd like to say thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Happy World Seagrass!